Welcome. Welcome. I feel like there's always a part of me that's giving a little bit of a cult leader. And I'm here to say that I am. Hi, welcome. Today we're gonna be talking about the best books that I read so far this year. I read 15 books so far this year, like 14 and a half, we'll get to that later. But I'm calling it 15. I feel good about that. I wanna talk about them. I haven't really talked about like favorites so far. I haven't done any sort of things like that. So let's, let's, just, let's just get into it. So number 10, and 11. I'm putting two books together because I don't care, because I'm crazy. We have both Aftermath by Rachel Cusk and A River Runs Through It by Norman McLean. I really couldn't have picked two totally different novels, but you know, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody's gotta cause a little bit of drama. Why not? Aftermath by Rachel Cusk. I hadn't read, what is this? Oh, this, ha! this is actually from a play that I did. That's a fake toilet, but maybe I made it real, you know? Anyway, that has nothing to do with the novel or it has everything to do with the novel. I was a little bit apprehensive to read Rachel Cuss because everybody's talking about how amazing she was. And I was like, oh my God, is she not gonna be amazing for me or is she gonna be amazing for me? And you know what? She was pretty amazing for me. This book, I don't think necessarily is, is something that mm, works for me right now specifically because it's talking about the deterioration of her marriage to her husband, her ex-husband. But this is going through the motions that she's feeling and trying to kind of grapple with the idea of not being partnered with somebody and kind of trying to have to relearn these patterns of existence that she kind of sloughed off because she was with someone. I thought it was great. I thought the writing was really suave in a way, really kind of takes you on this journey. And she packs a lot into a small little novel. But I thought what's most impressive about this was actually the last chapter, which she kind of, excuse me, kind of removes herself from the narrative and gives you the perspective of someone who we don't necessarily think about as explicitly affected by a divorce, not like the kids, not the two parties that were married, but somebody else who was affected by it. With that, she takes the form of a woman who is an immigrant and she comes to kind of live and work within the family. Cuss kind of reveals this like slight jealousy that she had toward this totally innocent girl and you know, the, the, the problems that this girl was living with and the ways that there was kind of no resolve because the people that she worked with now had a divorce. At least that's what I got out of it. It's kind of like vaguely alluded to. Cusk is a great writer, really good. I also feel like if I was a cult leader, this would be like the, the book that I would give my attendees. Don't you wanna join? <laughs> The next book, or Tied for 10, is A River Runs Through It by Norm McLean. I could have easily made it nine, but I don't want to because I don't think that this was like a massive love. I enjoyed the experience with this, but a lot of this wasn't like jumping out at me as amusement. It's basically primarily known for its main story, A River Runs Through It. It's turned into a movie with the hottie. Brad Pitt and then some other people. That story is all about fly fishing and McLean's journey to kind of discover his relationship with his brother through fly fishing and the relationship within his family and kind of, you know, understanding who he is and becoming a man in Montana. But I think one of the best stories in this, and I was talking to my father about this book as well, because he had read it, is Logging and Pimping, which is about him being a logger and the relationship that you had to have at that time because there was no electronic machinery, it was just all by hand. You had to have a relationship with the man that you were working with, one person on each side of this massive saw and logging together. He was kind of with this brute of a guy and they eventually kind of softened and became this solid unit together. The book is a whole kind of not for everyone, you know, wasn't like the best love of my life, but it was a love for a second. Number nine, the official number nine, right? That is the $12 million stuffed shark. I forget the name. This is all about the contemporary art world. And I listened to this on audiobook, And I think the reason that this sticks out to me is because I think we all kind of understand that there's a little bit of a fallacy in place regarding certain contemporary art, artsy fartsy. I love art. I've always been a huge proponent of art. Obviously the things that I love all fall within that capsule of art, but certain contemporary art figures and um, 
uh, praises, let's just say, aren't deserved. <laughs> um, this book I think was published in like 2007, so there's definitely needs to be an update, especially with like pricing and talking about astonishing pieces. It's kind of focusing on a lot of artists in like the late 90s, early 2000s, while still focusing on kind of the inception of contemporary art. What I found really, really interesting about this was it was talking so much about how it is kind of manipulated by the galleries and it really is all about branding all about branding, all about making sure that whoever is buying it in these upper levels of class and wealth, that they're sold the art, but also sold kind of the phenomenon. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. It did get a little bit boring at the end because there was a lot of repetition. Would like to see an updated version of this. So number eight, The Passion According to GH by... Stop. The Passion According to GH by Clarice. The Spectre. Clarice, I just want to say one thing to you. We've all been there. We've all seen a roach and smashed it and we went into a downward internal spiral. I understand. The first time I did it in New York City, I felt the same exact way. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. I was just going through something. This is a beautifully written novel. Oh my god. You know, you read this and you are immediately thrust into this, you know, tornado, basically. This tornado of expression, of doubt, of immersion, and you kind of are spat out. Kind of have to reorient yourself because everything's different afterward. Overall, very, very good book. A good book in the sense that it really makes you think. <laughs> really makes you think, and I'll leave it at that. <sighs> okay, so the next book, number seven, right? Number seven, Laser Writer 2. This is a book that I got from the library. I totally was in love with the cover of this. I thought it was so unique and come to find out the author is a graphic designer. This book is definitely not gonna be for everyone. Let me just say that right now. Let me just get it off the table. This is not gonna be for everyone, but this is for me. This is 100% for me. I was a Mac nerd growing up. I love Steve Jobs. I read his biography in high school. It was so intimate for me, this whole boom of technology. I don't know why, but I loved it so much. I was a huge Mac like snob. And this book is all about a small shop that was basically a service center for Apple products and printers and how this cast of characters made it so sweet and such a little kind of like pebble, a little beautiful pebble of what the tech industry was until it became so massive. This behemoth. I I loved this. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. You could absolutely read this in a day and I suggest that you read this in a day because I feel like the momentum and excitement that you have when you first read it might die off by like the third day if you don't just go through it. Love that. All right, number six, we have Trust by Hernan Diaz. I know a lot of people might be upset that this isn't like top five, my favorite book of all time, everything that I've ever loved and hated, put into one. This was a good book. This was a great book, actually. I read this very, very fast. I completely became immersed in this story. I needed to know what was happening. It almost kind of read like a thriller because you were like, what's, what's, what's the truth about these people? And then I just like didn't love the ending. I didn't love it. I don't know, so that's why it's not higher. Anyway, this is all about the bevels, the bevels. The bevels are like the top 1% of New York society. I thought it was really inventive in the way that it was written. I thought that the characters held so much weight that it just took you through the entire novel. You didn't feel like you were reading a you know 400 page novel. I was really, really invested in it. I just wasn't so in love with the ending, but I was so impressed by Diaz's writing. I thought there was a lot of beautiful little morsels of storytelling in this. Totally interested in Diaz as a writer. Enjoyed this, really enjoyed it, thought it was good. Five is another library book, so sorry we don't have it here, baby, sorry. Another Brooklyn. God, this was such a good, 
book. I think about this book often. This author, Jacqueline Woodson, I believe is her name, she writes primarily young adult fiction, and this kind of reads as young adult. For a little while, I was apprehensive because I thought that it was young adult, and I was like, well, maybe I should just start reading young adult again because I liked this. But this is apparently adult fiction. It has that same sort of buildings roman feeling, and it, it has these kind of like imparted life lessons. This is all about four girls growing up in 1970s Brooklyn and their diverging storylines, how they all start in this, this place that binds them together, and how they all kind of take these different paths. I think it's a really great love letter to Brooklyn. Maybe not a love letter, but it's a very realistic look into Brooklyn. And overall, I just thought that this was a beautiful story of four girls. It's very, very simple. And again, I've said this so many times before, but I feel like in a lot of these good stories, you don't need so much to just get your point across and tell the valuable things that you wanna tell. I really like this. All right, now we're getting down to the meat of it. We're getting down to the meat of it, baby. What better way to get into the meat of it than to uh, talk about Crash by J.G. Ballard. My guy, my guy, my man was going through something, okay? I don't know. I don't know what, <laughs> whoa, okay. First of all, J.G. Ballard is bold, courageous, and names the main character J.G. Ballard. So maybe he was just revealing parts of himself. Anyway, this is about a man who gets into a car accident and through this network of um, kind of a, uh, 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 <laughs> I can't even, ridiculously sort of like sadistically hedonistic people, he starts to enjoy and, for lack of a better word, get off on car crashes and people who have been involved in that. This was a journey, let me tell you that much. This was a journey, but I do have to understand that there is a part of me that loves this transgressive fiction, as you'll find out. I think if it's done well, it shows you the extent of where a mind can go and where it, it begs the question of kind of where do we rein ourselves in? Where's that line? And where does it stop being artful and useful? And where does it start just becoming grotesque? I think this had moments where it could have crossed the line, but it reined itself back in. And I think it's a good story. Definitely not for everybody. 100% not for everybody, but I thought it was a trip. <laughs> Sue me. And then, you know, just to be delicate and sweet again, we have <laughs> Of Mice and Men by Steinbeck. Reread again. I cried when I read this, so that shows me that I do enjoy this storytelling. If you don't know this story, it's a great American classic all about kind of the West and people trying to forge their own paths and the reliance that we have on other people and just the good in other people and how people can be taken advantage of, and it's beautiful, it's lovely, it's a classic, I love it, I cried again, you can read it in a day. Yeah, yes. And the second book I'm actually still listening to on audiobook, but girl, listen, okay, <laughs> I love it, I love it. I have to talk about The Shards by Brett Easton Ellis. I read The Informers by him in California. And I wasn't like so in love with it, but I was like, damn, I, I forgot about Brett Easton Ellis. And then I listened to Once Upon a Time in Bennington College and I became infatuated. Not even because I was impressed, I was just like, wow, I like the way his voice sounds. And I found out that The Shards was available for listening on my Libby app from the library. So I put it on not thinking much, it's like 24 hours. Brett Easton Ellis is reading it himself. And he has such an arresting tone. And he's so invested in these characters that he's written about. I can't put it down. Like I can't stop. The moment I wake up in the morning, what's BEE -E up to today? This is autofiction about Brett Easton Ellis, 17 year old self in Buckley High School in the affluent Los Angeles. There's a serial killer kind of going on around 
cute, murdering young girls primarily, but also young boys. It's all about Brett kind of becoming mature, but also breaking apart from this society that he's kind of built and these people that he's idolized within his friend group. I wouldn't say it's like an astonishingly classic novel, but I'm so into it, I can't stop. So I have to put it on there. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. And number one, for the babies out there, White Oleander by Janet Fitch. I don't care. I just reread this. I just reread it. I made a whole video about nostalgia. I think that spring is a time that people feel nostalgic. We've defrosted and now we're reborn again. And there's a certain nostalgia that's just coming over me lately. I don't know what it is. So I reread this book that I really felt formed me as a young girl. And you know what? It's still damn good. It's still damn good good. It's all about a young girl going from foster home to foster home and kind of trying to break out of the chains of the relationship with her mother, the mother who kind of seemingly put her on this path. And it's so good. I loved it. What can I say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for loving it. <sighs> so that's it, guys. That's it. Those are the top 10 books that I read this winter. That's it. If you don't know, I'm doing a Patreon book club. So going into spring, you're definitely going to be having more of a communal experience. You can join me over on Patreon talking about that, having fun. I'm very excited. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm excited. Anyway, let me know what your favorite book of winter was. What, nah, let me know. First part of the year, first half, of, first third is out, fourth, Jesus, is over. <laughs> so let me know what your favorite book was so far. Anyway, you guys are wonderful, you're fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one.